speaker would like to introduce. Oh. Running, running on time. Maybe even ahead of schedule. All right, AJ. Yeah, so I get a you know, very long introduction. So let me talk about me first. No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, the hook comes out. Uh, so I am. I do have the pleasure and the honor of introducing President Number What of Humboldt State University. Seven, eight. 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 I could think of six as I was sitting there. The names of six. I couldn't think of eight. So uh, that's your trivia uh, when you go home. And while I am not a graduate of Humboldt State University, I am sorry. I do have a child who went to school there. And I, we also know, all of us, how important Humboldt State is. So it's my pleasure this morning uh, to introduce Dr. Tom Jackson, Jr., who is the eighth president of Humboldt State University. And he's going to talk about everything we wanted to know about Humboldt State and everything that's going to happen. <laughs> Good morning, quick show of hands. Who here is an alum of HSU? Okay, who is not a, an alum of HSU? Good number. Of those who are not alums, who have family members that graduated from the university. So we are definitely well represented as a group. Uh, I can't say that that would be true if we left Arcata per se, because we're certainly sitting in Arcata. Thank you, AJ, for the kind invitation and great for the warm welcome. I should uh, first tell you that, uh, and it's full disclosure, about 20 years ago I lived in Kingsville, Texas. And it was Kingsville, Texas that my wife, who's, whose name is Mona, Mona Jackson, first joined Rotary. Now she actually joined before that. Yeah. She was uh, an active member in another place called Abilene, Texas. And so she, by default, brought that with her when she moved to Kingsville and remained very active. She is not active right now, nor is she here right now. We can fix she that. Will, she will join me at some point in time. I think that would be the case. You'll have to uh, fight for her on your own. <laughs> that is the absolute reason why I will not join Rotary, because she's an act, she is a very active Rotarian, and that's how our household works. That's hers. <laughs> Not mine. Okay. So I, I get to come here and, and be with you, but she can be here all the time. We have some couples here. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we might need that couples therapy after all. <laughs> I am going to spend a little time talking about, well, as Greg said, me. And, and then a little bit about what state universities represent, as well as some things about HSU and the things that we are facing as a whole. I'll go reasonably quick and not get into a great amount of depth on many of the items, but you'll see in words some of the things that we are dealing with as a university. In a nutshell, I need to be able to read my own screen because I don't know enough about myself. <laughs> I'm originally from Seattle, Washington. Anyone from that area? Folks will equate me with South Dakota because I moved here from the Black Hills of South Dakota. Beautiful, beautiful area. Western South Dakota, high elevation, about 4,000 feet above sea level. Uh, and as I moved here, folks said, Tom, you just have a way of finding the most beautiful places <laughs> to move to. And I could certainly say that about the five months that I've been here in Arcata. I think that it's the best five months in the history of Humboldt County. <laughs> I keep hearing about rain and other things. And from my point of view, this is very normal. <laughs> so, so keep that in mind. If you tell me that something's coming, my point of view, it's always going to be a sunny day because the last five months have been nothing but sunny days. I've uh, been to 31 countries in all 50 states, and I share that with the uh, Rotarians here because I know how important the international agenda is to everyone in here. And I take a lot of pride in knowing that I've been able to maneuver between the states, the different parts of the United States, and the different countries as someone who um, grew up very modestly in Seattle and had the good fortune to move about through other areas, not only because of the military, but really because of opportunity through my work. 
and so it's it's very rewarding. And I'll be happy to talk about each one of those places with all with all of you who have also traveled over the years. I have uh, two children, one wife. <laughs> Think that one through for just a moment. <laughs> uh, both of my children are uh, college age. I have a daughter who's a freshman at Black Hill State University. Uh, I think it's a really good school and a perfect school for her, and that's the university that I left as president. My son stopped out from that university, is working in Spearfish, and my wife has had two businesses, small businesses. She liquidated one. It was a Main Street boutique that sold trinkets and tourist items and alcohol and other things like that, their trade items. But she still has a very, very successful steakhouse restaurant in Spearfish that does very well. And that is her uh, heart and soul, which is why she's there and not here, because she comes back and forth, because that is very special of her for a lot of reasons. Talk now, I know there are folks. You can get a direct flight. Yeah, I'll work on it. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's my wife lives in New York City, so, you know. Well, that Denver flight is really perfect, because it, it's, yeah, you know, you know, just get on the plane, land Denver, Denver, Rapid City. The hardest part about that flight is the 60 minutes to Spearfish West. But she will, and there are others who will say, you can have a steakhouse here. But remember, I'm just the husband. <laughs> so that's something I can't say to her. That's something anyone in this room could say to her. And she had actually register it and keep that in her head. If I say it, it's just noise. <laughs> just uh, lastly, on this slide is uh, two things, actually, I, I want to bring up. I am a veteran of the United States Coast Guard, Army National Guard, Texas State Guard, and Indiana Guard Reserve. And I'm still active in the Indiana Guard Reserve right now as a training officer. I'm also a member of our American Legion and our commanders in the back. And so for the veterans in the room who are not um, Legion members, Commander, you want to say a quick word on how you do that? I've got the two that are in here, they, they know how to get you know, old of me. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> Lastly on that one is why HSU? HSU is an uh, amazing place with special people. And everyone in this room knows that from your experiences uh, as a student and someone in this community. We had the choice, uh, like many do, to look at different universities. And I'd like to say that we had a really good experience at Black Hill State University, a uh, kind university in many ways. But this was our time to look at HSU and to try and make a difference for the university and for this community. And that's nothing different than any of us who transition into different roles um, for all the right reasons. But I will tell you this, it was never my goal or dream to become a university president. Some people say, well, you're a university president. No, we just don't wake up and say we're going to be university presidents. We, like many others, grind our way through the ranks of higher education. I started off running a bookstore, I mean a uh, box office manager as a college student, selling tickets in the old days to go to events on campus and then work my way on through different universities. But the window of opportunity came as a vice president and dean at one point in time and the question was simple, am I willing to make that step to ascend to a CEO's position? And there are many who choose not to because we're enjoying the work that we're doing. Uh, as a VP or a professor, it's, it's good. It's comfortable. It pays well many times. You have good benefits, and you know that you're making a difference. But for me, I knew that, that I had a different calling, and something inside me said I need to make that step, partly because I'm the first in my family to finish a degree. And so in my mind, I've been given a good fortune to not only earn a degree, but to actually earn a living in higher education. And honestly, I don't know enough about when to stop, uh, if you think about that. So I know that I've been given a gift that I have to use to the best of my ability for all the right reasons. That's a little bit about Tom, because all those right reasons also mean trying to help Humboldt State become the absolute best it can be during my tenure as university president. Does that make sense? So. Now, a little bit about state universities, and many of you know these things, but I'm going to share them in a subtly different kind of way. For those in the room, we're benefactors of this, but there are many people in the United States and throughout the world 
who use higher education as the golden opportunity for a life-changing experience. All of us have jobs that, in many respects that required a degree. And many of us possibly didn't come from families that could write a check to Harvard or Brown or other places like that, or write a $50,000 check for a degree. Is that fair to say? Yes. So a state university gives the populace an opportunity to get a degree that is needed for the workforce. And by doing that, we create this economy that actually strengthens the communities in which we serve. Now, a more international way of looking at this is we are the top 7%. A few years ago, it was the top 1%, but we are now the top 7%. Those on this planet that have a college degree, 7 out of 100 people have a college degree. And most of everyone in the room raised their hands with some uh, college degree. That says a lot about how we are progressing as a society and the things and expectations we have as individuals within our respective communities. And so that stat, that number right up here, represents that public good that college, colleges and universities throughout the United States provide. We also are there because the public has an invested interest. Your tax dollars and others help support this engine in a way. And it helps in significant ways because the things that you do as an organization drive the economy in this community as well. But it also provides others the opportunity to succeed in this community. Lastly, I have to make the case that we can't do it alone. There's only a fixed number of dollars that support this enterprise. And, and a big chunk of that for our students comes from the kindness of individuals like yourself who now have earned a degree but have the ability to help others earn their degree. Myself uh, included, it, say it came down to a difference of $500 to $1,000 a number of years ago on whether I could pursue my college education. Think about that for just a moment. Think about the times that you needed a little bit of cash to pay the bills, and you found it somehow, and here you are, a college uh, graduate. Well, we still have those students today. Their success is determined by whether they can pay a $500 bill, which means they either step out of college or they keep progressing through college. You see how tenuous this can be? Even for our students today, as wealthy of a nation as we are, that's still the dynamic that we're dealing with every single day. So I share that because your kindness helps those who need that little push, and then it reverts. Back to us, uh, I give so that others someday in the future can also give. What we're dealing with as a university can be depicted in this. This may not make a lot of sense. Now, if you look at one on the right, you see happy, less grease peanuts, <laughs> chicken adobo flavor. <laughs> And then, on the other side, you see a Chinese New Year from Western Oregon University. And so Humboldt State University, despite all the things you read about in the news or other things like that, is in a competitive market, a very competitive market. We think of ourselves, and you'll see this in another slide shortly, we hear the news reports about the California State University system or the University of California system all these other metropolitan areas and how fast they may be growing, right? But we're Humboldt County, we're not Los Angeles, and we know that. But we read the reports thinking sometimes that we are. And this is a great depiction of that challenge, and I'll explain it here very quickly. The happy less grease is actually a real picture of a peanut bag from the Philippines, a place that I've traveled a number of times. And you can see how they're marketing toward that community. It's simple peanuts, but it's no different than what we're doing. Well, aside from the, the grammatical error, but we're talking about a second language marketed toward a first language. So the Greece is, in, is the wrong uh, verb. But the chicken adobo flavor is the most popular dish in the Philippines. So they're marketing their peanuts with the flavor of the most popular dish in the country. It's no different than peanut flavor, barbecue flavor peanuts that we have in the United States. Because how many times have you seen that? 
or some other flavor of peanuts that we just love to have and we buy that. So our marketing as a university in, in its simplest form has to evolve to fit what and who we're trying to market to. And that is the North Coast region and all things Northern California all the way up into Alaska. 30% of our student body comes from Los Angeles, about 15% comes from San Diego. Uh, we are probably within three years from becoming a minority majority institution, not because we are recruiting students of all colors, ethnicities, and races, but because California is changing very rapidly. 85% of our students come from someplace other than Humboldt County. Yes, that's, that is a fact. 85% of our student body comes from someplace other than Humboldt County. And that is not by choice per se, that's just who Humboldt County, who HSU is today. That's how we've evolved, which also means that those students that come to this university, we have to do something with them in a very deliberate way. Simply put, they're part of this community immediately upon their arrival because they can't drive home three hours every weekend or 16 hours to do laundry, get a meal, hang out with family, brothers, sisters, and things like that. So the role that we play as a community is extremely important to the success of HSU. Uh, our livelihood, collectively, both us, the community, and the communities around us all depend upon one another for that experience. We also have to market in different ways to the international agenda beyond the region, which is what Western Oregon is doing. They're basically promoting themselves as an international organization, university, which they are slowly becoming simply by recruiting students or sending their students to other locations. We are very non-existent in that space as a university. I can't tell you why we've gotten to this point, but I know that as the president it's important to me that we actually move into that space, not because it's a marketing opportunity, but I think it's the right thing for us to do. Our student body has to be competitive on the international scale. It's not just that they need to be good in computer technology skills. They have to be competitive in the global marketplace because that's the environment they live in right now. They regularly are playing games with people from throughout the world, yet we're not teaching them some of those competencies to actually thrive in that world. And if you think about your own businesses and where products come from, it's all integrated right now. Yet we as a university really don't exist in that space. And so you can see that that's our, one of our challenges, but one of the things we'll do very rapidly. I hope that we'll become a college of innovation, and that's part of the agenda for not only myself, as we look more upward and outward. Uh, let me switch to some other things real quickly, though, so I can wrap up and, and get you out the door and respond to some other questions. These are the things that I'm saying, and these represent the topics of uh, conversation on where we're going as a university over the next several years. There's things hiding in each one of these words, but I think you can read between the lines. We're trying hard to create the most positive, meaningful educational experience for our students, and that is inclusive of their experience in the community and on campus. <coughs> so simply as I can state it, our fundamental purpose is to create this positive, meaningful, educational experience for our students uh, at all costs so that we can get the students here and complete the trust that those families have invested in us as a university. So for those parents in the room of college-age children or college graduates, when you sent your son or daughter off to college, it was an implied trust. That trust was, you will return my son or daughter better than what I left. And sometimes you left us some inter interesting things. <laughs> Hoping we would do some magic. <laughs> and it took every piece of magic to make them the graduate. Uh, and that I speak from experience because I left my son at a university thinking we couldn't do what we could do. Hopefully you can do better. <laughs> so I'm there with you. Um, but that's important to us to create this really meaningful experience despite that. But we also recognize there's a trust. And that trust is that we have to be better at what it is that we're doing. Uh, and to help that son or daughter progress through this maze. In my opinion, if a student is good enough to get in to our university, 
we have to be great at helping them progress through it and get through the university. It's not our job to weed them out. It's our job to help them maneuver through this maze of stuff at the university today and become part of the educated citizenry that all of us enjoy right now. Does that make sense? Yeah. We also are focused on our community relations. That's just not me uh, talking to uh, this group. It's all of us as a university trying deliberately to become very active in our different communities up and down the coast. And I think you're seeing the product, the outcome of some of that effort, I mean, uh, from the university, particularly over the last five months. We also have to evolve our campus culture in subtle ways, and I'll touch on that as a closer in just a second. Get our spending in alignment with our budget. Uh, that you hear a lot about that, and a good piece of it has to do with the reduction of students that we've had over the last few years. That has as much to do with fewer students graduating out of high schools in this area than it does anything else. We project all kinds of things, but the data doesn't lie, and we know exactly who's going to be around 18 years from now, because those births have already happened. It's, it's basic math. Uh, we know who's coming through the pipeline, and we can ride those waves uh, as a university, and the last few have been somewhat downward because there just are not that many 18, 19 year olds in our region. And it shows in our demographic as a university. But that doesn't mean we didn't market to get more in, and that was our challenge to do that. And so we are trying to get our spending in alignment with what we are uh, receiving. Uh, we are strengthening what we're doing with our faculty development, outreach, scholarship, and teaching. And then lastly, back to what I mentioned before, our global agenda. Let me close with the campus culture and part. You'll see up here that we often talk about <coughs> diversity, and I view diversity a little different than some. I think the biggest challenge we have when we're talking about diversity is not what we look like, but what we say. Uh, because the conversation starts with some of the things that we actually say uh, to one another. And one of the biggest things I heard was when we lost football, folks would say we lost the diversity of the university. Well, that's tough for me to hear because I think it's crap, frankly. I think it's uh, I think there's more to diversity than football. Uh, and so, forgive my frankness in that one, I think it has more to do with how we engage one another, the civility of each other. And those are some of the tenets of this organization. The international agenda, the service and element of uh, Rotary, is it lives and breathes that tenant right there. And so does our university, Humboldt State. And so it's a lot more than that. And, and over the next few years, we're going to dive into those details and actually help ourselves evolve our culture so we are most inclusive of uh, all things at the university, particularly our own thoughts and our ability to engage in that academic agenda like we used to 20 years ago. Uh, we'll also strengthen our access uh, for our university. Uh, our campus is changing, like I said, and we're pulling people from throughout the region, but we're also going to pull people from, out, from throughout, excuse me, the uh, state. Uh, California does just fine, and we're a California State University, but we also are next to Oregon. We pull in so many people from, from Alaska, and we can pull in others from throughout the United States because the strength of our university is in the sciences, the arts, and education and business and all the other areas. And those are all popular degree programs, not just for us here, but throughout the region and the nation. Let me close with some quick ideas or thoughts. It was a number of years ago that this community gave land to help create this university. And you can read the little blurb up behind me. And that, in essence, set in motion what this university will always be, a community-focused type organization, because it was the community that originally invested in the university saying, we want this university to be here. And this university was the center point for creating an educational mission throughout this region. We were here to initially train teachers to do things in our community and to help that educational engine. That has never changed, and it hasn't changed today. That is still why we live and breathe as a university, to serve the community, the public good, 
and to produce this product uh, throughout this region that creates more educated citizens that drive this economy and this community. So let me stop at that point. Thank you for your time and respond to any questions you might have very quickly since I used up a little more time than I ordinarily would. Thank you. Scholarship program that's come out now for local students or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you're referring to Humble First, and if if you've heard, we've created a, a scholarship program targeted at students from the local counties to attend Humboldt State University. It basically is a four thousand uh, dollar total scholarship for individuals automatically who graduate from one of the high schools in the uh, regional county area, including Humboldt County, and Dillmore, Mendocino, and one other at uh, Dillmore College. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you have a son or daughter or a nephew, niece, grandson, granddaughter, who's graduated from any of those places, they automatically are eligible for that. Now it goes a little further. Uh, out of the kindness of Dan Phillips, an alum uh, for Tuna High, and a very good uh, member of Hulu, he's provided a good amount of money to spearhead a Fortuna High School scholarship. So graduates from Fortuna also get an additional $4,000 uh, to come to Humboldt State University or the College of the Randalls, which he also has a deep connection to. So those Fortuna High graduates uh, can automatically be eligible for $8,000 toward their college degree. What we are asking our community to do is to invest in the local high schools like Dan Phillips has for Fortuna so we can do the exact same thing for Eureka, Arcata, McKinleyville, and others uh, and really strengthen the, those students from those communities to come through CR or come directly to Humboldt State University. We get less than 30 students from Eureka every year. Uh, yeah, there are more people in this room than graduates from Eureka that come to Humboldt State. So we have our work cut out. And it's not that those students are leaving. It's not like they're flocking off to Cal State LA or something. Those individuals are going into the workforce or choosing not to go into higher education or going to CR and then transitioning out or finishing the career year or the two year. So we need everyone's help to keep this momentum going. And this is a small piece of that to help. So, thanks for asking. Um, what happened to KHSU and what are the plans moving forward? Um, anyone here listen to KHSU now? So it's, it's still on KHSU is the local radio station. And it's, and it's still on the air. It never has gone off the air, in fact. Uh, we use Capital Radio as the infrastructure to keep it going. Uh, Capital Radio will be in Sacramento on the uh, big organization within Northern California and they have supported us in Chico State University in a nice way to keep the infrastructure going. Uh, when I hear KHSU, I'm opt um, in a way I'm referring to it as there's the infrastructure and the maintenance, the operational side of the radio station and then there's the content side of that radio station. And many of us in the news are familiar with the content side of the radio station. What we've done, me particularly, I asked the faculty within our university if there's a place that they would like to use the radio station to connect it back to the student body. Now think about what I just said there because I've heard feedback from some who would say, why would you want to use the students? <laughs> and, and I actually have no answer for that. <laughs> but that, when we have this conversation about KHSU sometimes, that's what I get back. But the very people who volunteered for KHSU sometimes first started doing it as students. And, and that student space is still very important to me as the university president. And so we've asked our faculty if there's a place that we can develop content using our students. And we are working through some of those details right now. And so I'm pretty sure we won't go to a pure volunteer model, but our goal is to try and reconnect it to our faculty and the academy in a very deliberate way so that it can sustain itself 
for the long term. But it's also in the past been a bridge to the community. Students who have shows as students and then become community members, it's been a bridge between the two. And I, I think that's one of the things that people are missing. Um, the fact that you've asked and, and we've wanted to have ways to connect the community to the university and that was one. Um, that part won't come back, but I'm just saying that as frank as I can be right now. So. Other questions? Uh, I, I, as you spoke, I was looking out the window, not because I was bored. Uh, <laughs> but I don't see any Humboldt State branding anywhere here. Um, and uh, where I came from was Davis. And you knew that entire town was about UC Davis and vice versa. So, um, I mean, I, 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 you know, and I'll, I'll throw this over to our mayor as well. You know, is there discussions about how to try to create that presence on the other side of LK Wood? For example, and I want to thank you, the, the Small Business Development Center Lead Center Network, which runs all the small business development centers in Northern California, based in Humboldt State, is moving to Eureka, which is awesome, on 3rd Street, where the old gallery would be. I'm hopeful that we'll see some Humboldt State branding there, some Humboldt State branding at the Aquatic Center, and some other things. Um, I mean, is there a discussion about that with, with the cities and community groups about getting that kind of branding out to show that it is Humboldt State University, not Arcata's Hillside University or, you know, something like that? The, uh, did, did, does everyone here know that we have a aquatic center in Eureka? Yes. yes. And it's gorgeous. Uh, and, and sometimes that's, I would easily say, is one of our underutilized facilities. And we've done uh, not the greatest job of branding it as, as a university. We also are deeply connected to the Art Blue Center in different ways through the Center Arts, as many of you already know. That is part of what we are trying to do. And for every step forward, we take two steps back with the power outage. Mm -hmm. uh, because we get this momentum. I'm, not, I'm using the power outage as a very tangible example. But these little things crop up that cause us to pause as a university and focus on other more important things. And then we have to build that momentum back up. And so the short answer to your question is we have very deliberate plans to try and brand not only Eureka, but also Arcata and McKinleyville. And, and we'll probably be in a very different place this time next year. We're only five months here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I know you have places to go. I appreciate you.